The SVB bank collapse reveals the hollowed out nature of the United States economy. All right, guys, hello, and welcome to another episode of Thinking Out Loud. This week, we're going to be talking about a topic that has been in the news quite frequently. That is the SVB and Signature Bank Collapses. Um, I know this uh, story has been around for a little while now, and I'm just getting around to covering it. Um, I kind of wanted to wait a little while to discuss this because I knew there's going to be more developments going on. Um, and since SVB Bank, we've seen like three, four, or five major banks fail. We're seeing a lot of regional to mid-sized banks also in dire straits. And of course, the kind of crown jewel in all of this is the um, seeming collapse or the serious trouble that uh, Swiss Credit Bank is in right now. Um, and it seems like all the West right now is facing some serious uh, financial difficulties, uh, a bank crisis of epic proportions that some analysts are saying is just as bad, if not worse, than the 2008 crash. Um, so I want to do a video kind of trying to cover as much of this topic as possible. Um, I have a couple of articles from Geopolitical Economy Report that we're going to be discussing uh, from Ben Norton. You may know of him. Uh, he runs Geopolitical Economy Report, does really great analysis. If you haven't checked out his channel, I definitely recommend it. Uh, he also writes articles to go with his videos and discussions. And uh, Radhika Desai and uh, famous economist uh, Michael Hudson are also on that channel as well. So one of the articles I'll be discussing uh, is from Michael Hudson. We'll be going through there and he outlines the whole reason why this collapse is happening, the sort of speculative market engineering behind it and the faulty monetary policy that's been building really for a couple of generations, but especially since the 2008 crash. So we're going to be um, dissecting the article from him to kind of give you guys a basis of why this crisis is happening and maybe what some of its long-term effects are going to be, what, may, what it may be leading to. And then we're going to also do another article from Geopolitical Economy um, from Ben Norton, where he discusses the nature of the bailout around these banks. Uh, we've seen politicians... Um, from the Federal Reserve to the Treasury Department to Biden, uh, all across the board, uh, you know, trying to characterize this not as a bailout, but as an emergency relief fund and things like that. So we're going to, go going to be going through his article as well to, you know, uh, dispel those false claims and explain why it is a bailout and a very big one at that. And then we're going to be rounding off the video uh, with a brief discussion on what are some of the implications of um, this collapse of this ongoing crisis in the Western financial system and what that may be leading to um, specifically uh, de-dollarization, a trend that we're already seeing. We're going to be discussing how maybe this financial crisis is going to be accelerating that. Uh, so without further ado, guys, we'll go ahead and jump right into this and not waste any time. Um, make sure everything's working here. <laughs> Okay, so like I said, this first article we have here is from Michael Hudson. says, why the U.S. banking system is breaking up. Economist Michael Hudson responds to the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Silvergate and explains the similarities with the 2008 financial crash in the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s. So one of the things we're seeing surrounding this whole story is it's really being downplayed. Um, and, of course, a similar um, – sort of thing happened in 2008 where we had politicians, you know, trying to put the, uh, release the pressure valve on how bad the crisis was, trying to calm concerns so they didn't cause more bank runs and didn't cause a complete collapse of the market. Um, as we saw with 2008, obviously, despite those efforts, it became clear, increasingly clear over time that this was a serious collapse, a serious crisis, uh, that really the government had limited resources or tools to deal with, right? Uh, and so we're seeing a very similar thing right now with SVB. Um, you know, I'm not an economist. I'm not a geopolitical expert by any means. Uh, but we're going to try to use some of these resources to explain how this crisis is quite a bit worse than they're letting on. And Michael Hudson's article does a great job of that. Uh, like I said, he does a great job just outlining, you know, line for line, detail by detail, in a simple way, why this crisis is happening. So let's jump into the article here, guys. It says, the California-based cryptocurrency-focused Silvergate Bank uh, collapsed on March 8th. Two days later, Silicon Valley Bank went down as well in the largest ever bank run. So he's saying here that this is the largest single bank run 
in American history, U.S. history, right? It says the latter was the second biggest bank to fail in U.S. history and the most influential financial institution to crash since the 2008 crisis. So literally the second biggest bank in, to fail in U.S. history. Meanwhile, they're trying to characterize it as a more um, minor or less consequential regional bank crisis that the government has under control, right? Let's jump into this deeper reading here, guys. It says, the breakup of banks that is now occurring in the United States is the inevitable result of the way in which the Obama administration bailed out the banks in 2009. When the real estate prices collapsed, the Federal Reserve flooded the financial system with 15 years of quantitative easing, QE, to reinflate real estate prices and with them stocks and bond prices. Okay, so before we go into more of this reading here, guys, I want to set out a couple of definitions. One, this is quantitative easing, right? And another definition I want to bring up is a fire economy, that is financial investment and real estate economy. So I have a couple of things here um, from Investopedia, just, you know, a great little resource if you ever you know, studying up on your economics or trying to have a better understanding. And as you know, with economics, anything with the economy, there is a whole dictionary of just crazy ass, seemingly complicated words, right? Um, and this is a great, you know, little resource for you guys. If you're ever like, what the hell does that mean? You can come here and check it out. So this first uh, definition is what is quantitative easing QE and how does it work? We have a little um, infographic here. It says quantitative easing, a form of monetary policy in which a central bank, like the Federal Reserve, uh, Bank of Germany, whatever, purchases securities on an open market to achieve a desired outcome. Some more stuff here it says quantitative easing is a form of monetary policy in which a central bank like the U.S. Federal Reserve purchases securities from the open market to reduce interest rates and increase the money supply. So they're buying back their own securities, right, to lower interest and increase money supply. Quantitative easing creates new bank reserves, providing banks with more liquidity and encouraging lending and investment. In the United States, the Federal Reserve implements QE policies. A few key takeaways. Quantitative easing is a form of monetary pol policy used by central banks to increase the domestic supply of money and spur economic activity. In QE, the central bank purchases government bonds and other financial instruments such as mortgage-backed securities, MBS. Quantitative easing is typically implemented when interest rates are near zero and economic growth is stalled. In the United States, the Federal Reserve implements quantitative easing policies, right? Okay, so what this is is that it's the U.S. government buys back bonds from banks and things, uh, corporations that have bought them for long-term investments, but it wants to lower interest rates and it wants to increase the money supply. So the, the U.S. government, essentially through the Federal Reserve, buys them all back up in exchange for cash. So then the banks have a bunch of cash to back up deposits and to you know, potentially reinvest into development or, or stock with some bonds and stuff. And as we'll read with Michael Hudson's article here, he discusses how this quantitative easing, that is the U.S. government buying back bonds, lowering interest rates and uh, dumping an ass load of fucking money into the economy wasn't used for any actual economic growth. It was used instead to artificially inflate asset prices, right? Artificially inflate aspects of the fire economy, which we have a definition for here. Fire economy. What is a fire economy? Fire refers to a sector of the economy composed of finance, insurance, Sorry, it was an investment in real estate, hence the acronym FIRE. Businesses that make up the FIRE economy include banks and credit unions, credit card companies, insurance agencies, mortgage brokers, investment brokers, blah, 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 hedge funds, and more. The FIRE economy has grown to become a major contributor to the overall U.S. economy. This is the financialization of the U.S. economy, right? This is a move away from industrial capitalism, um, to financial ca capitalism. So it's no longer about reinvesting into corporations, building more factories, more warehouses, hiring more workers, increasing productive output. No, it's about, you know, the fire economy artificially inflating the price of uh, real estate, stocks, bonds, things like that. A couple of key takeaways. The fire economy is an acronym that re represents finance, insurance, and real estate sectors. 
The fire economy has become an increasingly important piece of the U.S. GDP, especially with the rise of financialization, like I was saying. Um, and we've had discussions about this in the past, guys, about, you know, the U.S. economy is supposedly worth somewhere between 22 and $27 trillion. But we've speculated on this channel, you know, at, with the rise of uh, the financialization of the U.S. economy, how much of that is actual productive output, how much of that is real economic value, and how much of it is – you know, monetary policy engineering and the artificial inflation of the prices of real estate and, and, and corporate stocks and things like that, right? Um, says here, some observers have argued that an increase in reliance on financial industries to propel the U.S. economy has left it vulnerable and has hollowed out the country's industrial and manufacturing sector. Like I just said, right? Okay. Let's go back to this article from Michael Hudson and, and, and you know, dive – into more of the analysis, right? Okay, where were we, guys? It says, um, what was inflated were asset prices, above all the packaged mortgages that banks were holding, but also for stocks and bonds across the board. That is what bank credit does. So again, to reiterate, the U.S. government through the uh, Federal Reserve bought back a bunch of its securities and its government bonds, right? Bought them back from the bank, that which had originally bought them for a long-term investment. This is from 2008, which dumped a, a whole metric ton of cash back into the economy, which these corporations then used to buy up a bunch of real estate, buy up a bunch of stocks and bonds, which made it seem like the economy was recovering, but as we'll see, it really wasn't, right? It says, this made... Trillions of dollars for holders of financial assets, the 1% and a bit more. The economy polarized as stock prices recovered, the cost of home ownership soared on low interest mortgages, and the U.S. economy experienced the largest bond market boom in history as interest rates fell below 1%. But in serving the financial sector, the Fed painted itself into a corner. What would happen when interest rates finally rose? So what we're seeing here is because the United States government, the Federal Reserve, was so intent on saving the banks, saving speculative financial capital, they've created a massive economy-wide bubble where the price of anything in the economy from housing to corporate stocks and bonds to all this stuff isn't actually realistically worth the value that they're saying it's worth. It's all artificially inflated. And what this has done is made it so that like now when the economy is going through a hard spot, right, and there's supposedly inflation, the Federal Reserve can't go in up interest rates in order to stop inflation Otherwise, they're going to pop this massive corporate and real estate bubble, right? But we'll let Michael do more of the explanation here, right? Um, says the Fed painted itself into a corner. What would happen when interest rates finally rose? The Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates a lot recently, trying to slow down inflation, right? Rising interest rates cause bond prices to fall, and that is what has been happening under the Fed's fight against inflation, by which it means rising wage levels. Really, the inflation is, you know, nominal. It's, it's essentially non-existent, like actual inflation from monetary policy, from the actual real cost rising cost of consumer goods. It's all, as we've talked about in past episodes, um, it's essentially just price gouging, right? That corporations are using their monopoly power to raise prices and then saying it's inflation. So the, the irony of this is, of course, that the Federal Reserve is trying to rise interest rates and potentially popping this big bubble um, to fight a problem that doesn't exist. Because as you and I know, as working class people, wages have not gone up that much. Certainly not enough to cause the massive inflation we've been having, right? Going on here, guys, says, by which it means rising wage levels, prices are plunging for bonds and also for the capitalized value of packaged mortgages and other securities in which banks hold their assets against depositors. The result today is similar to the situation that savings and loans associations, S&Ls, found themselves in the 1980s. 
leading to their demise. SNLs had made long-term mortgages at affordable interest rates, but in the wake of the Volcker inflation, that was when the Federal Reserve uh, tried to do what they're doing now, quell inflation, quell serious inflation uh, by rising uh, interest rates, right? The overall level of interest rates rose. SNLs could not pay their depositors higher rates because the revenue from the mortgages was fixed at lower rates. So depositors withdrew their money. To obtain the money to pay these depositors, SNLs had to sell their mortgages, but the face value of these debts was lower as a result of higher interest rates. The SNLs and many banks owed money to depositors short term, but were locked into long term assets, the securities borrowed from uh, money from the bank, at failing or falling prices. Of course, SNL mortgages were much longer term than was the case for commercial banks, and presumably banks can turn over assets for the Fed's line of credit. But just as QE was followed to bolster the banks, its unwinding must have the reverse effect. And if it has made a bad derivatives trade, it's in trouble. And we'll get more into what exactly derivatives are here in a second. So what is all of this, guys? And how does it relate to SVB, Signature Bank, Silver Bank, all this stuff? So what it was is these vulture capital banks, uh, SVB, all these different banks, they were paying higher interest on deposits. They're paying higher interest to their depositors that had you know, deposited their money in the bank. In order to pay for this higher uh, percentage rate on deposits to their customers to encourage more deposits, they had bought a lot of long-term U.S. bonds. That is, they essentially what a bond is, is that they had borrowed money to the U.S. government in exchange for interest rate, right? So the high... Um, level of uh, return on people's deposits that they're paying was based on the reality or the fact that they were going to make profit, a percentage on their return for borrowing money to the U.S. government by buying bonds, right? But then, because the price of the bonds interest rate was really high because the price of interest in general was low, the U.S. government started to rise interest rates through the Federal Reserve, which made the price of these bonds, the value of these bonds, plummet, right? So then what happened is, th as we'll see in this next article, is there was a bank run on SVB and other banks because they kind of saw that, well, with interest rates going up, how are they going to pay us these huge returns on our deposits, which are very abnormal for a bank. I think normally a bank pays like 0.025% or something on a deposit, right? So, you know, these investors in the bank, depositors in the bank were like, well, how is this going to work? How are they going to pay these uh, larger returns on our deposits when the price of all their assets is going down due to the Federal Reserve rising interest. And then that caused a bank run. Okay. So then everyone's taking their money out of the bank. But as we have seen, this bank and these banks had, you know, s invested a lot of their depositors' deposits into buying bonds, right? So then they had to sell all these bonds at the new rate, which was a loss which made the company go bankrupt, right? And there's a lot more details to this that will come on as well. So that's essentially what caused it, right? And it's very similar to what happened with SNL, only with SNLs, it was through uh, mortgages, long-term mortgage investments, right? Um, but as we're going to see, there's more to this that makes this appear to be a possibly a systemic issue when it comes to America's financial system, right? Um, and we're going to be talking about derivatives here. Um, just an article... Or a tweet here from Boston, Boston Herald. SVB Bank um, melts down following a Thursday where its stock fell off the cliff, dropping 60% in one day. For those in the crowds, it's feeling like 1929 all over again as customers converge on the bank's location in a modern-day bank run. Going on with the reading here, guys, says, Any bank has a problem of keeping its asset prices up. That is the price of its mortgages, the price of its bonds, the price of its stocks, right? That's what asset prices are, the price of your assets. With its deposit liabilities, deposit liabilities uh, being the reality that people are pulling their money, their deposits, out of the bank because of concerns that the bank is not uh, solvent, right? When there is a crash in bond prices... The bank's asset structure weakens. That is the corner into which the Fed has painted the economy. Recognition of this problem led the Fed to avoid it for as long as it could. 
But when employment began to pick up and wages began to recover, the Fed could not resist fighting the usual class war against labor. And it has turned into a war against the banking system as well. Silvergate was the first to go. It had sought to ride the cryptocurrency wave by serving as a bank for various brand names. After vast fraud by Sam Bankman-Fried, SBF, was exposed, there was a run on cryptocurrencies. Their managers paid by withdrawing the deposits they had at the banks. Above all, Silvergate, it went under. And with Silvergate went many cryptocurrency deposits. So it's kind of the origin of this of this problem where these banks got themselves into hot water by making uh, risky investments, right? And then when the whole house of cards came tumbling down because the Federal Reserve raised interest price, uh, pretty much nerfing the price of their assets, they were in serious crap, especially when people started to withdraw their deposits. The popular impression was that crypto provided an alternative to commercial banks and fiat currency. But what could crypto funds invest in to back their coin purchases if not bank deposits in government securities or private stocks and bonds? What was crypto ultimately if not a simple, simply a mutual fund with secrecy of ownership to protect money launderers? And with it came a source of turmoil that has reached vast magnitudes beyond what caused the 2008 crash of AIG and other speculators. Derivatives. J.P. Morgan Chase and other New York banks have tens of trillions of dollars worth of derivatives. That is, casino bets on which way interest rates, bond prices, stock prices, and other measures will change. For every winning guess, there is a loser. When trillions of dollars are bet on, some bank trader is bound to wind up with a loss that can easily wipe out the bank's entire net equity. So yet again, guys, another example, like I was saying, of these banks making extremely risky um, bets and, you know, hoping to turn a fast profit and knowing damn well that if the whole house of cards comes down and ended up being a bad bet, as we'll see, the United States government will bail them out. So what they did here is they made risky bets on cryptocurrencies, which when all the fraud came out with SBF kind of tanked the, you know, trust people had in cryptocurrencies. So that all dropped off bad bet on their part started this problem where people started withdrawing more from the banks. And then that caused the bank run. And then the bank run got worse when people realized that these banks were losing their solvency and then it completely bankrupted these banks, you know? So with this, it was cryptocurrency. Um, in the past, it was these faulty, you know, mortgage packages that these banks were betting on. Um, and this is just how the system is, is set up, guys, is protect the asset prices of these banks no matter what, even if they're doing risky bets. And as you guys might expect, we're the ones always picking up the bill, right? Um, but I want to kind of dive into this next article I have here, guys, talking about um, the bailout of these banks, right? And how, one, the government painted it as this is not a bank bailout. It's coming from an emergency relief fund that depositors have paid into. Meanwhile, that's a whole crock of shit because, you know, most of those fees and stuff that go to pay for this um, sort of emergency relief fund, one, come from people that, you know, like you and I, that don't have a whole lot of money in bank. And we pay the fees, uh, the bank fees and things like that. And, you know, one example of these bank fees is, of course, uh, what's the word, um, you know, withdraw fees. Like if you if you don't have any money in the bank or you go over the amount of money that you actually have in the bank, you get a, 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 a withdrawal fee of like $25 or something. So we're paying for it in that way. And, mean, and then the U.S. government also painted this as being, you know, we're not bailing out the banks. We're not bailing out the bank shareholders. We're just bailing out the depositors, right? But this uh, article here that I have from Geopolitical Economy Reports, Ben Norton, um, explains how, you know, the FDIC limit for backed up by the government for deposits is $250,000. But most of the people um, banking at SVB, Signature Bank, and stuff like that, weren't small investors, right? They were people that were part of vulture funds, uh, venture capitalists that were, you know, speculating on tech startups and stuff like that, hopefully to create a pipeline between, um, 
you know, Silicon Valley tech startups in Wall Street where they could become, you know, open exchange companies, right? Uh, so I'll just jump into this and read this here, guys. It says, U.S. government bailout of Silicon Valley and banks is $300 billion gift to rich oligarchs. The U.S. Federal Reserve printed $300 billion in a week to save collapsing banks and bail out Silicon Valley oligarchs. 93% of Silicon Valley banks' deposits were unassured, uninsured over the FDIC limit of $250,000 but the government still paid them. 56% of SBV, SVB's loans went to venture capitalist and private equity firms. Says the U.S. government printed $300 billion in a week to save collapsing banks and bail out Silicon Valley oligarchs and venture capital firms, paying them all of their uninsured deposits. Meanwhile, some of the very same Silicon Valley tycoons who benefited from this bailout have tried to cynically rebrand themselves as subversive populists, claiming they are fighting against the big Wall Street banks with which they have closely collaborated. And if we go back to that Michael Hudson article, he talks about how, you know, this all this crap with cryptocurrency being a libertarian fetish uh, that goes beyond uh, the government's you know, monopoly control on the financial system and, and money. Meanwhile, what do you think's backing up all these investments in cryptocurrency? What do you think these people are doing with their cash when they sell cryptocurrency? Where do you think they're depositing these assets in big Wall Street venture capital firms like Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and things like that? The whole thing is just a fucking sham, right? Uh, going on here, guys, says three banks collapsed in the United States in the span of one week in March 2023, Silvergate Bank, Silicon Valley Bank, and Signature Bank. Silicon Valley Bank was the 16th biggest bank in the country and the second largest bank to go under in U.S. history. It had $209 billion in assets and went down in the biggest bank run ever. Signature Bank was the third largest bank to collapse in U.S. history with $118 billion in assets. So as we can see, these aren't just like small mom-and-pop regional banks that are essential to our economy. These are huge uh, institutions with, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of billions of dollars in assets that are all speculative assets like cryptocurrencies and tech startups and things like that. Um, in the week between March 8th and March 15th, 2023, the Federal Reserve effectively printed a staggering $300 billion to stabilize the banking system and bail out Silicon Valley's banks and signature banks' uninsured deposits. And you can see these graphs here. This is from the Federal Reserve website. Um, this is the price of um, cash, or sorry, this is the amount of cash, liquid cash in the economy. Boom, March 8th, pew, straight to the fucking moon, right? Insane. And I just want to touch on this here, guys, because when we got those checks from the government during the COVID so that we could fucking live and pay a rent or uh, when the government, you know, implemented a uh, eviction moratorium and increased food stamps and, and did the child tax credit to help people pay their fucking bills and survive during uh, essentially a complete economic collapse because people couldn't go to work during the pandemic. We have had all this inflation blamed on that. Meanwhile, they'll print $300 billion and we will not hear a dick, dick about inflation, will we? Just like we didn't hear anything about how those PP, forgivable PPP business loans that were supposed to be to keep, uh, were supposed to exist to keep people on their payrolls instead of being on unemployment, right? So these companies got forgivable loans from the U.S. government to the tune of like a trillion dollars, I think it was, uh, to keep people on the payroll, keep paying wages, uh, reinvest back into the businesses so that when the pandemic was over, these businesses would be good. But what we saw was, that is not what happened. I mean, even uh, with business owners here in my own small town, we had stories of like, for people that were still going to be working, they're supposed to get COVID quote unquote hero pay. But, you know, local business owners are here, like bought their kids new fucking cars, uh, bought new houses, crazy shit. Like even here in this small town, and this was an endemic thing, but we never hear about how those PPP loans caused any inflation. No, it was just a little bit of money that it gave us. Um, hundreds of millions of us to survive, right? That caused the inflation. Um, going on here, guys says, 
the money they borrowed was was used to pay their uninsured depositors, the AP Associated Press noted. In doing so, the government has essentially conveyed the message that all deposits in banks in the United States are insured well above the $250,000 FDIC limit. This encourages depositors to put their money in risky banks that offer much higher rates of interest like SVB and Signature Bank did. So this is a big fucking message from the U.S. government, from the Federal Reserve. Go ahead and do as risky bets as you want with as shady as banks as humanly possible because if the fucking bill comes due because you guys made a bad investment, we will pay for it, right? The purpose of the FDIC limit of $250,000 is that it's going to save the savings and livelihood of working class people or small business owners. You know, in the grand scheme of things, $250,000 $250,000 in the it seems like a lot to me it's a lot to anyone watching the show I'm sure but that's not a that's not a shit ton of money that's like enough to live for a few years if shit really hits the fan right or to deal with medical expenses or whatever that's the purpose of the FDIC is to protect working class people from financial collapse so that their money just isn't gone overnight because the bank went bankrupt and this uh, came about obviously during the great depression as a protection against these sort of things its purpose is not to bail out 300 billion dollars worth of assets and deposits for people that had millions of dollars in a bank that's whole purpose was to speculate on tech startups and cryptocurrency that's not what its purpose is but the federal reserve and the u.s government has said go ahead we're going to extend that fdic credit to any deposit no matter how risky um, going on here says U.S. President Joe Biden and Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen claimed that the government was not bailing out these banks, but their comments were deeply misleading. The bank shareholders were not technically bailed out, but their wealthy depositors were. Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank are insolvent, but as collateral for the $143 billion in quote unquote loans, more like cutting a free check. The Fed accepted their treasury bonds at par, meaning significantly more than what they are actually worth on the market, using the face value written on the securities when the banks purchased them before Fed interest rate hikes caused bond prices to crash. So the government was paying for these assets, these falsely inflated assets, for what they were when they bought them instead of at the loss, which caused them to not be able to pay their deposits, which caused them to bankrupt, right? I mean, that's just a fucking cash giveaway, the few, cash giveaway, just a few extra steps. Um, going on here, we're getting towards the end here, guys. Says SVB, a key link between Silicon Valley and Wall Street, bailed out by U.S. government. Many media reports have presented Silicon Valley Bank as a financial lifeline for startup companies in the tech industry. Like, this is what's spurring uh, ingenuity and innovation in the tech industry is banks like Silicon Valley Bank. That's why we got to bail them out because this is what's, you know, keeping America competitive in the tech sector. But this portrayal is misleading. Venture capitalists and private equity firms were SVB's main customers, making up, as we saw said earlier, 56% of its loan portfolio at the end of 2020. Only around 20% of the bank's loans went directly to startups and tech companies. So that's just a complete and brazen lie. Um, venture capitalists and private equity firms were SVB's main companies, customers, making up 50% of its loan portfolio. So venture capitalists, private equity firms that are doing all the speculative bullshit that we're so used to seeing crash economy is what the majority of SVB made its loans to. Risky ass bets, i.e. cryptocurrency again says SVB's chief business was making loans through fund subscription lines to venture capital firms, MarketWatch reported. The same venture capital investors that the bank had supported for years ended up killing it, the website summarized. Forbes cited an analyst who explained, SVB is also not your average regional bank. So quite clearly a lie, even from Forbes, rich assholes saying it. They are a niche bank catering to the venture capitalist crowd and are not a traditional everyday consumer bank. Which begs the question, why were they ever even given a consumer banking license in the first place where deposits could be backed up by the FDIC? I mean, this is an example of all the sort of deregulation and regulatory capture that's happened. This was a venture capitalist bank 
uh, meant for people to speculate on the price of tech startups, cryptocurrencies, blah, blah, blah. And yet it had a consumer banking charter that allowed it to be protected by the FDIC. I mean, this is what happens when uh, bankers own the regulatory agencies that are supposed to regulate them. You end up with shit like this. Um, Let's see. Like SBB, Signature Bank worked closely with venture capital and private equity firms. Another important customer base consisted of cryptocurrency companies. 20% of total deposits, like we talked about in the last article. The financial website, Wall Street on Parade, which is a great resource, guys. Check them out. Explained that Silicon, Valley's ba- Silicon Valley Bank was a financial institution deployed to facilitate the goals of powerful venture capital and private equity operators by financing tech and pharmaceutical startups until they could raise millions or billions of dollars in Wall Street initial public offering, IPO. Wall Street on parade analysts Pam Martins and Russ Martins went even further, documenting how SVB was in essence bailed out by the U.S. government throughout 2022 before it crashed. Um, and I'm sorry for all the reading here, guys, but I mean, this is just so succinct and it covers everything you need to know. Um, but yeah, what we have here, like I said, Forbes, rich assholes, even clearly saying that this is not a regional bank. This isn't a credit union. This isn't a mom and pop bank. This isn't a bank essential to the needs of working class people or, or, um, um, or small businesses. It's just a, a front organization to essentially, one, launder money from cryptocurrency, and two, speculate on um, tech startups, where a lot of these tech startups, like with apps, uh, with pharmaceutical companies, they'll get all this investment in millions and millions of dollars, and then, uh, you know, then they get IPO stock options, then they sell a bunch of stock, raise the price of stock, and then they scalp the whole fucking company. So it's not even anything that's doing innovation or actually producing technology or innovating technology. It's just a fucking, uh, not a Ponzi scheme, but just it's just a whole ass racket, guys. It's quite simple. Um, so we have this from uh, Pam and Russ Martins do- giving us some more analysis on this. Uh, to put it bluntly, this was a Wall Street IPO machine that enriched the investment banks on Wall Street by keeping the IPO pipeline moving, padded the bank accounts of the venture capital and private equity middlemen, and minted startup millionaires for ideas that often flamed out after the companies went public. This is what I'm talking about. The whole thing's a fucking lie. There's nothing innovative about it. There's nothing pushing the cutting edge about it. It's just a fucking scam. And then once it's been invested in on the IPO, People realize it, and then the company gets scalped, and then it's just a fucking flop. But along the way, these venture capitalists and and private equity middlemen have made a fat sum of cash out of nothing along the way, right? These are the functions and risks taken by investment banks, Silicon Valley Bank, with this business model. They should have never been allowed to hold a federally insured banking charter and be backstopped by the U.S. taxpayer who was on the hook for its incompetent bank management. We say incompetent based on this fact alone. Although there were clearly lots of other problem areas, $150 billion of its $175 billion in deposits were uninsured. I mean, that's just suicidal. But it's not suicidal when you know that the U.S. government's going to come around with the fucking paddles and go, Boop, and zap you back to life, even if you've gambled on a coin toss for fuck's sake, right? Hundreds of billions of dollars on a goddamn coin toss. The bank was clearly paying a dangerous gambit with its depositors' money. Adding further insult to U.S. taxpayers, the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco was quietly bailing out SVB throughout much of the last year. Federal Home Loan Bank's are also not supposed to be in the business of bailing out venture capital to private equity titans. Their job is to provide loans to banks to promote mortgages to individuals and loans to promote affordable housing community development. This is how sick this is, guys. The Even the institutions that are ostensibly set up, you know, through the federal government, through state governments, to ensure that we get housing are in bed with these venture capitalists in one giant fucking scam. And they're in bed bailing these corporations, these venture capitalists, these risky investment um, institutions out. Where's the help with the housing and community development? Nowhere to be seen, of course. 
Nowhere to be seen, of course. But again, this is what happens when banks, financial capital, owns your fucking society. Going on here, it says, according to SE filings by Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco, its loan advances to SVB went from zero at the end of 2021 to a whopping $15 billion on December 31st, 2022. <laughs> Insane, dude. Insane. In one year, $15 million. The SEC filing provides a graph showing blah, blah, blah. Uh, $15 billion. I'm going to go ahead and guess $15 billion of home loans in conjunction with like community organizations to help get homeless people off the street. If, if those uh, organizations in conjunction with the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco work together to get homeless people into, you know, uh, low-income housing developments or even owning their own home, we probably could have wiped homelessness out off the streets of San Francisco. But no, it went to bail out um, the IP venture capitalist uh, Wall Street IPO pipeline. Business as usual, boys and girls. Um, now, this next part that I'm going to get into um, has to do with Jimmy Dore uh, interviewing um, David Sachs who went on his show and tried to paint SVB as being some mom and pop, you know, tech startup company. And it's just really sick. And, you know, Jimmy Dore just, and I know a lot of you guys have come to my channel from Jimmy Dore, but the guy just keeps getting worse and worse over time. And I don't know. It's, it's just sad, but I'm not surprised at the end of the day. This is what happens when you kind of cater to right-wingers in the MAGA crowd. I mean, when it comes to Jimmy Dore at the end of the day, guys, I think he's, you know, at best a sort of misguided, useful idiot that is sort of manufacturing the consent and paving the way for fascists uh, to seem populist or – at the absolute worst, and as we'll see with some information in this, I mean, he's essentially a fucking psyop. So we'll go ahead and jump into the reading here, guys, and, and discuss this before moving on to discuss what some of the consequences, the long-term consequences of this financial crisis are. Okay, let's jump into this section here, guys. It says, in a softball interview on the Jimmy Dore show, Sachs claimed the Fed bailout was needed to save a quote-unquote vibrant regional banking system from the big four banks that the government has deemed systemically important, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo. Sachs did not mention that he has made many investments in Silicon Valley companies that stand to benefit from the Fed bailout. Sachs was an early investor in the CIA-backed data mining company Palantir. Technologies. Palantir was co-founded by Sachs' long-term friend and fellow PayPal Mafia member Peter Thiel, a far-right billionaire who was a major funder of Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Palantir's clients include Wall Street banks, the CIA, FBI, and NSA, the notorious U.S. government body that engages in mass surveillance, which is quite ironic given that Teal and Sachs often use civil libertarian rhetoric to rail against statist authoritarianism. This is why this whole ideology is such a fucking joke. The people backing it up are some of the richest, most well-connected asshats in the fucking world. Today, Teal is a top donor to the Republican Party. Sachs is also a significant campaign contributor to so-called populist GOP politicians like J.D. Vance and Blake Masters, both of whom worked for Teal. Teal, Sachs, and their Silicon Valley oligarch friends have spent decades advocating right-wing culture war propaganda. Um, that's all I'm going to do from this, guys. Um, I just want to bring up this part because, one, it... It shows, like I said, the fallacy of this fucking libertarian lo logic. Like, all of this libertarian right-wing bullshit is cooked up by some of the wealthiest fucking people on the planet. And it's on purpose. It, it, it's on purpose to, to move you away from wanting to develop a more socialist, a more democratic society to this winner-takes-all, dog-eat-dog bullshit. Right. And they're the people pushing all this propaganda uh, uh, through things like the Fa Heritage Foundation about be mad at trans people, be mad about woke, 
all this type of shit. I mean, all of this stuff is astroturf, and it's really disturbing how many people in the United States have fallen for it, right? And it just goes to sh and, and then the other thing is, like, again, like, what is Jimmy Dore doing if he's a so-called progressive or a leftist or a socialist, dude? What are you doing having this guy on here? This guy that is directly linked to Palantir Technologies, a CIA Q Intel Pro startup. I mean, it's just it's just disturbing, guys. Like the 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 state of even progressive media and stuff like that. I don't know, man. Um, and like I said, it's like at 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 best, Jimmy Dore is a useful idiot for these guys. I mean, this guy went on and tried to paint SVB. Like it was some sort of mom and pop regional bank that's under siege by the biggest financial corporations on the planet. Meanwhile, it's a direct, like we talked about, pipeline from venture capitalists to Wall Street IPO that's used to uh, pad the accounts of middlemen and things like that. And Jimmy Dore, I saw this interview, didn't, qu qu like he just went along with it. Uh, and so, like I said, he's either a useful idiot that has no idea what he's talking about or he's in bed with these people. And the more I see some of the people he has on, like he had um, Jackson Hink, he just has these weird right-wingers on. And, you know, at the end of the day, guys, I won't be surprised to see something come out in the future where he's getting money directly from these people. I mean, I don't know what other explanation he, there is. It's either that or he's an idiot. I mean, he is an idiot because you hear him talk about what socialism, communism, the guy has no idea. It's just an embarrassment. Um, but that's really all I have for you guys regarding this uh, bank bailout, this crisis itself. Uh, sort of, I hope I've kind of touched on what caused it. P hopefully, through Michael Hudson and Ben Norton's article, put it in the simplest terms possible. If you have any questions about it uh, or anything to add, please drop comments letting people know. But I want to jump into my next article here to kind of try to analyze. What are some of the larger, grander, and scope implications of this? Uh, we know that the United States financial system with the Federal Reserve has backed itself into a corner where the seeming health of our financial system is based on this quantitative easing asset price bubble. That is to say that the real, the value, the supposed value of the U.S. economy is so financialized that it's completely false. And the price of all these corporations, which we know many of them are zombie corporations, completely laden with debt, um, the, the value, quote-unquote, of the U.S. economy is built on this asset price bubble um, that's you know propped up by quantitative easing, that is low interest rates. But now that we're having troubles with inflation and things like this, you know, the Federal Reserve has lost one of its only tool, tools to – you know, cool down the economy during instances like this, because when they rise the interest rates, it's going to pop this speculative bubble. Um, and as we know, the U.S. government's also, the U.S. government, the U.S. economy is built so massively on debt, you know, it just really shows how hollowed out. There's no industry, there's no real jobs, there's no real investment. It's just all financial, speculative, um, you know, capital. And it just shows really, like I said, how hollowed out the U.S. economy is. Uh, especially when you compare it to uh, economies like Russia that, you know, has a lot of exports that it does of raw materials and China, which is obviously the, uh, you know, uh, workshop of the world, as it's been called. Um, but I have this article here from Financial Times, and I know you're going to say, why are you reading Financial Times? That's a Wall Street, blah, blah, blah. Uh, because it's a little bit different than the Wall Street Journal, where the Wall Street Journal is like a propaganda piece to manufacture consent for people falling in line with, um, you know, Wall Street's uh, interests. Financial Times is more about providing real analysis to actual capitalists uh, who want to protect their money and do the best they can with their money. So with Financial Times, a lot of times you'll see they'll tell a little bit more of the truth because these lies that they push onto us, working class people, uh, you know, if they get caught in some of these lies and these half-truths, it can be bad for their portfolio, right? So we have this article here uh, from Financial Times. Prepare for a multipolar currency world. The U.S. dollar still dominates debt markets, but some niche-sounding data suggests things could be set to shift. And I, <laughs> I just love this picture here to go with it. I mean, this anti-China fear stuff. Is usually so cringe, but something about this one just makes my dick hard. I don't know what it is. Uh, and this is by Jillian Tett. 
so we're going to jump into this, guys, and we're I'm bringing this up because we're seeing the de-dollarization trend moving towards a multipolar world really started starting to accelerate at a faster pace than many of us, you know, might have expected or even hoped for, you know. Um, and I just want to relate to how this de-dollarization trend is going to speed up as a result of the, you know, completely hollowed out nature of the U.S. financial system and the U.S. economy, right? It says here, Russia and China are sparking new jitters in Washington. That is primarily because of their staged managed displays of diplomatic unity. You got to put a little bit of propaganda in here. Stage managed displays of diplomatic unity. There's nothing stage managed about it. These economies in conjunction with the third world are integrating at an incredibly fast pace to try to overcome U.S. dollar hegemony, hegemony and U.S. hegemony in general, right? Xi Jinping went to Moscow last week. Vladimir Putin uh, pledged to adopt the renminbi for payments between Russia and countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America in a bid to displace the dollar, embracing it in its central bank reserves to reduce its exposure to toxic American assets, quote-unquote. Nothing, quote-unquote, about it. As we've seen with um, the sort of asset price inflation that we've talked about, the price of Assets in the U.S., the price of stocks, of American corporations, the price of b the value of bonds, um, all this stuff is quite literally toxic because it's falsely inflated. It's just one giant bubble. And um, the rest of the world is being smart and trying to diversify their assets and move away from this shit because the bubble's going to pop eventually. I don't know when or how, but it's going to. And if you have all your eggs in one basket, the U.S. basket, you fucked. Uh, China's capital account is an impediment to wider use of its currency, meaning that the sort of restrictions China has on uh, capital flows, capital inflow, it just, at the end of the day, China has, you know, um, some modicum of the dictatorship of the proletarian. We could have hours and hours of debate on why that's right or wrong. But at the end of the day, it has some modicum of the dictatorship of the proletariat in that you know, at the end of the day, despite having capitalist investment, despite having a capitalist class um, in China, the Communist Party has the final say on what is done with capital in the country. And, of course, the Chinese Communist Party, the Chinese state, has a large stakehold in many of the country's largest corp private corporations. And in some instances with those private corporations, they have the largest stakehold in those corporations. So what this is trying to say is in the past, people had been – um, wary about uh, investing in Chinese currency because at the end of the day, the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party has a final say in what's done with that currency, has a final say in how investment in the economy is developed, right? Uh, going on here says, concerns are afoot that this month's U.S. banking turmoil, everything we've talked about today, inflation and looming debt ceiling battle that's going on in the U.S. Congress, where again and again and again, always, this is so regular, where they say, we're not going to raise the debt ceiling, so then the government's going to shut down. I've lost food stamps uh, when I really was fucking hungry because of their bullshit. So all these things uh, is making dollar-based assets less attractive. The dollar is being debased in order to fund the bank bailouts. Peter Schiff, the libertarian economist, thundered this week. Um, again, another libertarian, uh, but he's not completely wrong um, you know, the amount of money being printed does cause inflation. And as we've seen, this uh, money being printed is used to artificially inflate the price of mortgages, uh, real estate, um, uh, and investments in, in, in stock buybacks and things like that. So in that sense, the dollar is being debased in order to fund the bank bailouts. He's partially correct, but it's a lot more than just these bank bailouts. It's a system of itself, right? Jim O'Neill, the former Goldman Sachs economist, published a paper this week arguing that the dollar plays far too dominant a role in global finance and is calling on emergent markets to cut their risks. So we even have a Goldman Sachs stooge, and as we saw earlier, some guys from Forbes saying uh, something similar, and obviously Financial Times having a whole discussion about this. And it's like, why would they do this? Why would they try to undermine the credibility of the U.S. dollar um, it's because there are different little fiefdoms of capitalists in the U.S. capitalist system. It's not like, you know, a lot of times capital, these different fiefdoms will have, you know, um, similar interests. Like having wages low is great. Having the U.S. government bought up 
uh, to deregulate or regulatory capture is great for all capitalists. These are vest- vested interests that they all have in line. But a lot of times, different fiefdoms in the capitalist bourgeois society have interests that don't go in line with one another, right? Uh, I'm not going to dive into this too much, but, you know, one thing that's good for one industry, like, say, the war economy, might be bad for, say, the financial economy, the banking economy, the banking industry, rather, right? Um, So, you know, you have capitalists within the capitalist system that are seeing the tenuous situation that the U.S. banking system and financial system is in, uh, industrial capitalists too, and they're like, what the fuck, you know? So it may even serve some of these multinational corporations to, even if they are U.S. um, corporations, they have no allegiance to the U.S. government. The U.S. government's just a a tool of state power to defend their interests. And if that tool is no longer necessarily the best bet for them, they don't have any qualms with other corporations or sorry, other governments around the world having a bigger slice of the global pie of uh, weakening the U.S. dollar so they can diversify their risks, especially when they see that the U.S. economy is just one giant fucking risk right now. Right. This is them hedging their bets. This is what capitalists do. Right. Um, Saudi government announced that it will start invoicing some oil exports to China and renminbi separately. France, even France. Just did its first liquid natural gas sale in uh, RMB, that's Remimbi, and Brazil has embraced the currency for some of its trade with China. 72% in 1999 to 59% as central banks increasingly diversified their investment funds. That is, um, sorry, it says the dollar's proportion of global reserves has sunk from 72 to 59% since 1999. And now we're seeing that process accelerate as China works with Russia, China works with countries in the Middle East, China and Russia work with countries uh, in Latin America and Africa to try and build some sort of coalition that can resist the complete monopoly power of the U.S. dollar, right? And like I was saying, this banking crisis is only going to spur that on more quickly because even people, capitalists, Living in the West, they're like, shit, this isn't looking good. Maybe, you know, moving to a more multipolar currency world will be better for our investments. Um, uh, it says, Ad- advent of wholesale bank, bank-to-bank central digital currencies could theoretically accelerate this diversification by making it easier for non-American central banks to deal directly with each other in their own currencies, Right. Um, so that's just saying the very nature of fiat currencies and, and the digital world makes the idea of having a multipolar currency world much easier because you can just sort of, you know, switch the price, you know, buy and sell currencies and trade and move capital around much easier. But the dollar still dominates debt markets, and the volume of dollars held overseas has soared this century. In one striking overlooked detail, Uh, about this month's turmoil is that the currency has retained its near record strength versus the G10 and emerging market currencies. Global investors wanted to grab the greenback, that's the dollar, during the recent crisis the Federal Reserve's launched a daily swaps program with other central banks. This enhanced use of dollar swap lines will ironically further strengthen the global dollar system and its powerful network effects. So I want to make a note here because what it's talking about is – the COVID crash, um, the inflation, the sanctions on Russia that caused uh, the prices of commodities to go up, all these things, all these things, all these things, which made the global economy look really risky and fucked up, uh, caused people to buy more American dollars because historically the American dollar being the global reserve currency um, has always been a good bet. They're like, oh, fuck. This is getting risky everywhere else, especially in third world countries where investments are really on the fence. Let's buy a bunch of dollars. So they're trying to paint this like this is necessarily a good thing, and, and maybe it is. You know, With this, we've seen um, for the first time in a long time the euro and, and the dollar be roughly worth the same value. The euro has you know, historically the last couple of decades been worth more. Um, but what, what they're missing is as the price or the value of the dollar goes up, this is bad for countries that have a large amount of their national debt tied up in U.S. denominated accounts, okay? Because as the price of the dollar goes up, so does that mean the value of debt that they have to pay. This makes it harder for countries in the third world developing economies to pay back 
debt dena- uh, dollar denominated debt, right? Because now the dollar is worth more, which means your debt's worth more, which means it's harder to pay off. And a lot of these countries with this odious debt, this debt that's purposely meant to keep people, countries in a state of neo-colonial oppression, it's already hard enough to pay it. Now it's getting even harder. So contrary to what they're saying in the short term where people are buying more dollars because it's more valuable being a boon to the long-term uh, continued hegemony of the U.S. dollar, it actually you know, presents a situation where countries in the global south, developing countries, have more of an incentive to ditch the dollar and try to, you know, use the renminbi or do currency swaps like China's been doing where they're saying, hey, buy some renminbi, hey, we'll buy your Chilean pesos, things like that. So this, rather than being a good sign in the long term for the U.S. dollar, uh, coupled with its banking crisis, um, actually ends up being more of, of, like I said, an incentive to move away from the dollar, right? But they don't talk about that here, obviously. Uh, going on here says thought provoking research on trade invoicing published last year by the Center for Economic Policy Research um, said that the CPR paper suggests this might now be slowly shifting as Chinese trade has expanded in recent years. RMB use has, RMB use has risen too. So much so, in fact, that it now exceeds euro usage for trade invoicing, which is striking, quote unquote, given China's low degree of capital account openness. That's talking about, at the end of the day, the Chinese Communist Party dictates how the economy will be uh, organized, right? The CPR... The CEPR says that it argues that contrary to conventional wisdom, lack of capital account openness may not fully prevent the RMB from playing a stronger role as an international and reserve currency. So what does this say right here, guys? This is huge. So one, this is huge because for the first time ever, the Chinese renminbi, the RMB, is being used more for trade invoices, global trade, than the euro. Insane. That's insane. That's unheard of. That's huge. Right, but this is also saying what this this part here striking, given that China's low degree of capital account openness has long time been a barrier to more people investing in using the RMB for global trade. Okay, so earlier they talked about how the the low amount of capital influences the the controls on capital inflow and outflow that the Communist Party that the Chinese government has has been a barrier because. Capitalists don't like that. They want to be able to bring money in, take money out when they want. China doesn't allow that necessarily. They have restrictions on that. So that's a huge thing. Capitalists don't want that. They want free wheel of capital inflow. They want to be able to deindustrialize a society as quick as they industrialize it, like they did with the United States, right? So what is this saying? What is this saying? They're alluding to the fact that um, that level of control, even though that sucks for us, might be a better option as compared to the completely falsely inflated U.S. economy. They're saying that even though the Chinese uh, government could at any time stop inflow or outflow of capital, of our capital, that may be a better investment than the completely false, risky investments of the United States government and United States economy and corporations. That's insane, guys. Insane. I mean, it just really shows you how they're like, shit, even the big capitalists are like, oh, man, we may have milked this fucker as long as we can, right? Um, going on here says, after all, it notes $200 billion offshore our renminbi market has already emerged, and the currency is being used in invoicing and settling China's foreign trade and payments in a global network of clearing payments. The net result, the CEPR pre- predicts, is that a multipolar currency world could emerge in the coming years. But to my mind, it seems a sensible medium-term bet. Like I said, they're hedging their bets. They're saying, well, maybe we should consider this, guys, because it's getting bad here in the U.S. And even just a multipolar pattern could come as a shock to American policymakers, given how much external financing the U.S. needs. So what are they saying there? Uh, As we know, the United States government has the biggest national debt in the world, Uh, So many of its corporations are what we know as zombie corporations where the revenue it produces is just used to service the debt. Um, And all of the U.S. empire, its military spending, is based on being able to borrow an unlimited amount of cash uh, because all around the world trade is done in the U.S. dollar, which artificially inflates the price of the U.S. dollar, which just lets them keep doing it. 
let's the empire keep running. Let's corporations get away with all these bailouts. Print, 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 print. Doesn't matter, right? Doesn't matter. Uh, so this is why you have U.S. politicians so afraid of, even though, and I want to be clear, even though we are seeing this policy, this process of de-dollarization, um, you know, fast forward due to recent events, i.e. the banking crisis right now, it's going to take a long time, guys. It's going to take, you know, at least a couple of decades, I would bet, and we never know anything can happen. Um, but even this little bit, even this little bit, U.S. politicians, the Pentagon, the military industrial complex, all these people, they don't want it because they realize once that art stone of dollar diplomacy, dollar um, hegemony is gone, the American empire collapses with it because the people are no longer doing trade in the U.S. dollar and the U.S. dollar loses its uh, artificially inflated value. They can't keep borrowing from other countries and from financial institutions to bankroll the endless military spending that props up U.S. military and political hegemony, which in turn props up U.S. economic hegemony as well. So they recognize that once that arch zone's down, the whole fucking Coliseum is coming down, guys. Um, but yeah, guys, so that's all I really have with you. This video has gone pretty long. Um, so I'm just going to kind of kill it off right here. I hope I've done a decent job explaining what caused the bank crisis, uh, how this... Uh, Bailout is, in fact, a bailout, and it's not any of this bullshit they're talking about. Um, I hope I've, you know, explained all of this inner workings between Wall Street and Silicon Valley and uh, how it relates to the hollowed-out nature of the U.S. political system, uh, uh, financial system, economic system, sorry, and how these decades-long, generations-long gambling and fucking around with the economy and deindustrialization, financialization economy has really left – the U.S. completely hollowed out uh, and how that uh, that it's being hollowed out may be leading more quickly than we thought to a more multipolar world where the U.S. empire accelerates along its decline. Uh, but again, guys, that's all I have for you. Uh, drop a comment with your thoughts. Add more information. Ask me questions. I'll try to elaborate uh, better. In, in those comments if I can because I know we covered a lot here today. Uh, you know, Just drop a comment. Drop a like. Don't forget to subscribe, guys, if you haven't subscribed already and you appreciated this video. And um, don't forget, guys, you can support me in my independent media work on Patreon at patreon.com slash entitled millennials. We got all kinds of exclusive you know, benefits and stuff like that. And you guys have really been turning out on there. I think we're almost to our $150 first, first goal. Um, and if that's maybe not your thing, but you want to support the show, you can do PayPal don donations at paypal.me slash entitled millennials. Y'all guys kept me afloat while I got to my new job here, guys. So I really appreciate that. Um, but you know, guys, we'll go ahead and end it right here. Check out the Patreon, uh, send a PayPal donation if you can, and don't forget to subscribe all that. Um, but as always guys, it's great hanging out with you. I love you very much and we'll speak again soon.